<laughs> Omar. I'm just holding in my breath here trying to get a pose. How are we looking here, Chief? Dude, actually, I'm saying, like, like legit, legit, no jokes. You're looking more juicy. <laughs> uh, crazy what actual training will do to an individual. Um, there's so much, man. We haven't had a duo episode in how long? Probably at least a month. At least, right? Well, we've been having the, like, 2019 Reunion. alumni tour. Yeah. I mean, for those who have been paying attention <clears throat> since the beginning, which is... You know, can I just say it does not feel like 2019 was four years ago, Omar? I don't know. Am I crazy? <laughs> no, like, it's that feels it's weird. Well, we know what happened with the world and we don't want to get canceled. But let's just say that we were clearly it was a meteoric rise of myself and Eric. The pyramids were literally lifting off of the ground um, and then something happened, a two year delay. And now we're back and better than ever, literally with Eric, with his physique, which is Eric said, please don't talk about my body in this episode. And I said, now nah, we got to do it because the man's looking maybe that's <laughs> why it feels like we're going back to 2019. So my yeah. last contest season. But yeah, we've yeah. had um, Lauren Conlon on Andy Galpin, Eric Trexler, of course, the man Connor Heffernan when we were in Texas. Now, Dr. Alex Coliari Turner, mm. Dr. Grant Tinsley, as well as Cliff Wilson, who were some of our first guests in the first two years. And some of them are like right around the same time. Um, and we've all had them on in the last week. Like we've had, uh, we, I think there was a period where we were going like duo, duo guest, yes. duo guest, duo, duo guest. And then in the beginning it was like guest, 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 duo. Um, like when we uh, couldn't get somebody then we had to talk to each other. <laughs> but um, but yeah, like it's uh, it was it was pretty cool because I think it's created a lot of nostalgia and reflection for us, and mm -hmm. it's cool to catch back up with people and see like, oh wow, like you know Alex finished his PhD and he has all this new interesting data on how things have potentially changed in the landscape of our understanding of myonuclear domain theory, right? Like, oh wow, Trexler is now working at Duke University, you know, with the guy who wrote Burn, you know, like Herman Ponzer and. Cliff's, you know, just deepened his resume even more. And he's a constantly learning, iterative coach who I think really embodies what it is to be evidence based and highly successful. And he's sharing that information, you know, and we had Andy to talk about his his true specialty, you know, muscle fiber types. And, and Lauren, you know, she was just coming off of being an active competitor when we had her on years ago. And now she's much more in the coaching space and reflecting and looking back on you know what's the state of the bikini division so it was this really cool opportunity this last week or last weeks i should say to um kind of see how things have changed in the iron culture and now we're getting to time a little duo episode which is that chicken soup for the soul we both need Man, Eric, there is so much to discuss. Uh, I'm thrilled. It's it's almost, it's weird how positive I'm feeling. I was like, is this actually happening? What's going on? Um, because we have an exciting announcement here. There, there, there are many different things to talk about. Uh, actually, Eric, do you want to talk about math first? Or the seismic change, which might be, uh, Eric, I'm going to tell you the title proposal after we make the announcement. But mm. listen carefully, turn up the volume, turn up the bass. Where do you want to start with, Eric, with that? Maybe tease first with the mask thing and then the big announcement, what you want? Yeah, we'll tease because because one leads to the other, would yep. you say? Yeah, yeah. you right. go with so, the mask and then I'll, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't know if people have been paying attention, but we are doing things on social media like <laughs> good influenza should with mass. Yep. We got mass research review popping off on Instagram. And dag damn it, if you didn't know it, Omar, I don't know if you've heard of YouTube. Um, but it's a uh, it's a growing platform oh. that um, has what is sadly considered long form content in 2023 on it. <laughs> two I mean, at least at least two minutes long, sometimes <laughs> as much as ten, if you want to tank your views a little bit. Um, but uh, yeah, we have a mass research review YouTube channel, and we've now just done our second installment of the mass office hours which is something we've been thinking and kicking around, like how do we get better engagement and have a more positive influence on the community? Because like we have awesome subscribers, don't get me wrong. And we have a pretty sizable number. We're very um, privileged and honored. And we're, we totally crushed our own individual metrics of what we expected mass to grow to from a subscriber side, but it's all behind a paywall, right? So, you know, we do what we can with our cover stories um, and we do what we can, uh, you know, with, with sharing like, research sound bites. people want to sign up for our newsletter but not everybody wants to read even 
a 500 you know word research byte kind of deal in their in their email and, and let alone a 4000 or 2000 even word article as our cover story that's for free and i but a lot of people do want to understand the applications of science which is what we're all about so anyway I've been doing uh, mass blasts from the past on a, on, a, on a weekly basis, except for the weeks I forget as a reel where I go over, you know, older research because mass normally focus on the new stuff. So that's on our Instagram. You know, we've been making pretty much four to five posts or reels per week on the mass research review Instagram, getting a lot of really positive feedback, which is cool. And it makes me feel like we're having uh, more of an impact and educating people in a way that's obviously fun. Um, and then the, uh, the time I, I, I gotta say, Trexler's the man. He's just a lot of fun. I, I just, he's wholesome. It's, it's always nice hanging out with him. He's incredibly sharp, but also humble. And he's just a good communicator. And he's also very good at partnering with people. Like he does, like he did a great job when he was doing the stronger by science thing with, with Greg. Um, I think, he does a great job every time he's on Iron Culture, which might be, might be happening more frequently. And so we just did an office hours and previously did it with Dr. Zerdos. And they just were really good. And like the people who tuned in, obviously it's hard to grow a small YouTube channel, but the people who tuned in really seemed to enjoy it. Uh, we got to answer their questions live. Um, and he's he's surprisingly tech savvy. And the skill set he has is, is, is maybe more than you would anticipate based upon hearing how he cooks and the way he views mm. or doesn't view any modern media content. But now the man knows how to run a YouTube live. He's got this, like, you know, you say elevator music and you think, why would I want to listen to that? But no, man, it, you come to our office hours 10 minutes early and you'll be smooth jazz chilling oh. for 10 minutes, just excited thinking, man, this is going to be a vibe. And it was. So anyway, We've got our, our office hours live that are open to anybody on our YouTube. We've got our Instagram. Um, and we've also just been switching up the content a lot more. Like we've had from the mailbag or in the press. Like it's not just what study came out last month and let me review it. We're trying to make uh, our content, A, more accessible, more of it out there for everyone to see long form and short form, as well as uh, more pliable to what people are actually interested in right now. So like there wasn't necessarily published research on the recent controversy around whether or not, you know, aspartame is actually a carcinogen and harmful. But there were some shifts in certain health organizations around the classification that was then blown up and misinterpreted in the press. And Trex was like, well, I'm just going to address that in an article. I don't need there to be a study on it for me to write about it. And so we've been doing a lot more things like that. So anyway, I'm just really happy with where Mass is going. Uh, we've got a really good synergy between us and I think one of the best things we could do was bring on Lauren. Um, and and this is her in the midst of the hardest part of her PhD. I'm telling you, this is half power Lauren Colenso simple. So soon, not only will she have the the doctor title um, and, uh, and, and, and be contributing more to mass, but I think we're going to see even more really good things come in there. So anyway, shameless self-promotion, but mm -mm. more so what I'm saying is I feel good about what we're doing and I think we're making a positive impact and that does get the cookies in my heart nice and warm. Eric, let me just echo that first. Uh, Lauren's fantastic every time she's on Iron Culture uh, where she contributes to Mass. She is an honorary Canuck. I could bestow that upon people. Um, just sensational. What you said about Mass Monthly Applications Strength Sports. If you're not subscribed, you should be. I would say probably from the last five years, besides obviously interacting with uh, people such as Helms and uh, those at that level, Mass has been one of those, you know, Eric, you know, with um, my business with Rascal and everything else, uh, taking up a lot of time. Time is precious. And so what's a resource that I could use to still stay up to date where things are broken down and easy to understand? Of course, like you could uh, uh, dive further into it, get more uh, complex, but a way to filter all the information that's coming through the fitness space and an easy to navigate place. And so Mass has been clutch for me. And it's something that I, that's what I don't promote like on the YouTube channel or anything like we're back on, we're posting. I don't accept sponsorships obviously because I do like to stay independent, but it's something that I could wholeheartedly recommend without reservation. And it's not because of my personal connection to you. It's because of the practical, tangible impact it's made on me and other people that are interested in furthering their knowledge and then how they use that knowledge to help other people. 
And what I'm actually noticing, and then we'll we'll get to the announcement, man, I'll say, it's interesting to me, and I think, like, I spoke about this before, but what's cool in powerlifting is no one questions, like, who to fall in terms of good coaches or their practices based upon how they look or how strong they are. It's a known thing because I think it's a competitive sport that you need to get people at the top of their game. And so I think people are more readily accepting of let's say oh the latest research shows this like like uh, the reps and reserves or like a uh, reigning rp it, d- it doesn't really matter but like coaches will listen to this and then it'll get filtered down to athletes but i think in the general fitness space we haven't seen a regression or anything but there mm. certainly is that my viewpoint what i personally can experience in my life is the only thing that i know to be unequivocally true and therefore it's all that matters to me I think, therefore I am. I pump, therefore I'm right. Um, and we've we've seen that. And so I think during some of these times, I have seen certain shifts. I would just say that like some of the loudest voices, it reminds me of 2012 where I participate in the space and you hear, you know, some people give certain takes and they're fine. I wouldn't agree with them. But I think because there's become so many knowns, Eric, such as like, you know, okay, the role of macronutrients or like things like meal time is important or not. Like you go down the list of like the, the big ticket items, it, it's baked in, like there are truisms that people are now just flying off the cuff, shooting from the hip in terms of what they think and what they feel and what has worked more for them. So I think in this time, it's more important than ever before to tether yourself to some aspect of reality where these things can either be challenged or tested and then verified or disproven. So again, man, I, yeah, before I I do want to say that big announcement, but I mean it, Eric, like, yeah, I mean it. Well, first that means a lot and I really appreciate it. Second, the more things change, the more they stay the same because, um, one of the most marketable things you can do in fitness has always been look at the amazing things that I've done. Uh, you know, and you position yourself as, as an authority on yourself that somehow translates into everyone else. Um, but yeah, it's, it's wild to see like basically trolls with good physiques, you know, like that's what really what we're talking about. Right. Like I sequester myself. There's no one to compare me to. I train in my basement. I don't need to test myself by competing. I don't need to coach other people. I have found the truth in the light. I'm a, I have a convincing argument. I have a convincing physique and I can get on, on the internet and that really hasn't changed since 15 years ago, you know, Um, it's just that people are getting better and better at, uh, identifying what is being rewarded in the algorithm and understanding basically psychology and marketing. Right. And there's nothing wrong with that is so long as you can see that there's a, a thousand of those people and they're all doing something different. So maybe it's not necessarily what works for everyone, but, um, and on the flip side of that, so the other side of that coin though, is that some of the people who we might perceive as being more having an in the trenches bias like um i do what works i don't work about the, i don't worry about the science who are still around active today and they are what we might consider the old guard but i think a more respectful way of saying it is that they're much more aware of the errors they made in the past and they're interested in truth today they've actually come full circle in some ways and i think it's really really interesting and i this is going to sound like it's just a flex, but some of the big moments for us at Mass were when we saw that Dave Tate signed up as a subscriber. Mm-hmm. And we're like, whoa, like, or, or Stan Efforting, you know, like, if you, like, there was an interview with Stan Efforting. It's like, so what do you do these days? And it's like, well, I stay up to date with things like Mass because that's, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm, I understand how things are. I'm like, what the, f-? like, yo, these are people who I didn't feel worthy of informing previously. You know what I'm saying? Like, um, fun story, real quick about Stan Efforting. One of my, maybe my fifth or sixth meet, 2009, right? We're all warming up. It's the, the very beginnings of raw lifting. Uh, a, one of the meets in California that was moderate size decided, hey, we're going to have a raw only meet. And a bunch of these lifters show, shows up, it, it, it blows up. It, it's a Chip Conrad's old body tribe. Nice. Okay. And it's it's uh it's not it's not about whether it's drug test or not. So everyone's allowed in there. I'm in there. The, the whole three DMJ crew, a bunch of our athletes, and guess who else decides to show up and compete in the meet? Stan. Stan Efforting. Wow. So the white rhino is there, and I think this is right maybe right around the time he might have won his IPB Pro card. So he's huge, right? And he asks if he can warm up with us, and I'm like, uh, yeah. And I'm pulling my last warm up of a measly 405 
on sumo deadlifts before I opened up, I think it 450. I think I went like 450, 475, 495. Or no, I went 500. This is the first time I pulled 500 pounds and I was like elated. And uh, if you've ever listened to Stan talk about deadlifting, he feels like it begins with a kind of a leg press off the floor and then it feels like the initiation of a barbell row. So his part of his warm-ups are that he does like explosive barbell rows. So he goes up to 405, which I, you know, pulled <laughs> like an RPE 7 and yeah. proceeds to do like a set of like four barbell rows with it. And everyone around us is like, okay, we are not the same, even though we're both like, you can see your name and my name on this meat list, but we are absolutely not the same. So anyway, I, d- I doubt he even, I, I, th- I think I might have introduced myself to him. I doubt he remembers. I don't think he th- thinks he's ever met Eric Helms because that back then I, I was not even on the internet really except for the bodybuilding.com forums. But anyway, so, so imagine what the, the perspective is like for me to then look up years later and say, yeah, I'm a subscriber to mass. It's like, wow, you know? And I think that's what I want to be like in years from now, um, where there's so many great people coming up, data-driven strength, you know, muscle mm-hmm. and feels podcast, shout out mm-hmm. to Dr. Pack and soon to be Dr. Milo Wolf, right? I mentioned Lauren Colenzo Semple already. Um, there are so many really, really good people coming to lead in our space that have a blended background of coaching, competing, or at least doing the damn thing in the trenches, as well as being engaged in research, um, that it's almost surprising to me that people are going to look at some person who's like just doing their own thing and making big, bold claims. And, and yeah, they look good in their own like lighting and shit like that. Um, but these kind of like cult personality figures who are sequestering themselves it's like yeah i guess you could listen to you know the guy with a good physique in his basement or you could listen to someone who is like coaching thousands of people competed like like why would you listen to cliff like you know what i'm saying like anyway but um it's it's just an interesting thing that that both of those things are happening at the same time and it's crazy how siloed the internet is and i'll leave it there yeah the only thing love that story eric to add in addition to that before we make this big announcement is that I do think you're right that some of the veterans, if you stay in the space, they're interested in what we're both interested in. We're, we're competitive people, but also we want the results. Like we're lifters at heart and we understand like where do we need to go to get those results, to understand what is better for us. And I think for most people, this is like a hot take, but I have been thinking about it for a while. I think it's not about being competitive and it's not about what, how are you define like getting to your maximum. It's about finding your tribe that you identify with mm. and it's a cultural participation in something. So it's a sense of belonging like, oh, this person, I'll, I'm going to make this up. Here's an example, Eric. Like I just previewed on IG like rascal, we're going to have like a fun. It's kind of like uh, a subversive jance, right? As we call them like jean pants. Cool. But like people yep. like, but there might be some people as an example that they take it. And I saw it. It got a lot of different likes, but like some people were like, oh, this is kind of a bristling against uh, uh, some norms that people should wear or whatever. But I identify more that where I'm rugged. I'm someone like that. Some people wear it ironically. But anyways, the point is, is that people will silo themselves in terms of the space or the niche that they find themselves in. And it's less about, oh, I want to be the best powerlifter or I want to be the best bodybuilder. And it's more, hey, man, I like to lift this person. I kind of vibe with like, quite frankly, yeah. right? Like I've. And they're saying and what I want to hear. And, that, and that is totally fair if that's your goal. I think in ways that can be underrated, but I think one of our roles, and that's what I tried, and like we're speaking about this now, you've done a fantastic job either with your students or with the new emerging people in this space to try and give them a platform. And I think that's something that because you are rewarded and you feel like a god where you want to build, it's so tempting. I can't, like, unless you participate in the space, you see the likes, you see the rewards, you see the social validation, to basically just put yourself atop the tower. Like, that's why one of our longest running jokes is about the pyramid. Yeah. It's obviously, it, it said uh, facetiously, um, that for these people, they choose to become the guru, which is the worst yeah. thing, as opposed to being the service of the community. And I think, Eric, to that point, uh, I'll, I'll just kick it off, man, that maybe the title for this video is The End of Iron Culture, in parentheses, as you know it, 
because we're you un- unfortunately eric and myself are too united in the sense that that's why we started the podcast that's why we get along as people that's why we travel together and there's a lot of stuff maybe we'll talk about in this episode or another episode from a recent trip that it's helped it was in part helped to reignite a spark that was long lingering there but something that i can now say emphatically is where it needs to be f- for my own personal journey so that's a personal side note but we're united in terms of trying to provide the best information in a way that we like to do. Like, you know, Eric and myself, like uh, we like to joke around. We like to uh, uh, be sometimes a little silly. Uh, we also like to have top tier guests allow them to speak. Usually, maybe we'll give them bit. five minutes. Yeah. Eric, 10 minutes? What, 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 do we, what do we give them in 90 minutes? What do you think? I think since this is not YouTube, we, we can get them up to at least a 10% of a 90 minute. Yeah, that's you know. yeah. So cool, Approaching 10 minutes. And we don't even charge them for the right to be no. on our pod. Like, think, Eric, come on. Good guys. Team good guys. Come on. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we could be monetizing this in 10. I'm saying. <laughs> Charging them. <laughs> anyway. Anyways. Yeah. Um, all that to say that we both were in agreement. I came to Eric. Uh, this was during the trip. And I said, Eric, we've been in this relationship a long time. It's time to open it up a little bit. And Eric's like, oh, okay. Like, w- what's going on? And I said, we both want to have the best possible podcast and i just i don't know i just want something different i like if only there's someone else that was like a bodybuilder like that was a competitive bodybuilder that has his phd that's very knowledgeable when it comes to both like exercise and nutrition um you know maybe if maybe we'll we'll just like the person's name wouldn't be eric but maybe be Eric with an A, just to change it up a little bit. But, but only, if only there was someone like a free agent that was instrumental for you know another podcast, for other works that they've done, where they're just one of the voices that I routinely respect. If only we could bring a third person on and make Iron Culture even better in the service of the community. And Eric said, it sounds like you're describing something, someone. I'll, I'll let you take it over from here. So I said, I want to, I want to change it up. And I described this person, Eric. Yep. Uh, for me, it was an interesting one because at first I was like, oh, he wants an open relationship. That's pros and cons. Um, a little less burden on me. Uh, I don't have to be quite as like, I don't have to meet your neediness at all times. And my wife will be a little less annoyed. (laughs) So that's a good thing. Right. But then I realized, and I got a little jealous. I was like, oh, he wants someone specific. This is, isn't just an open relationship. He wants the iron thruple. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, there's only one person that this narcissist could have a thruple with. And it is the person most similar to me that I can think of with the same name, similar background, uh, and, you know, and basically just someone who gets confused for me anyway so it doesn't feel so hurtful to my incredibly fragile ego so i was like you know what i've already slept with myself many times since i was a young man but i've never really had the experience of sleeping with someone else who i see as myself and who i can take (laughs) ownership of their uh, everything in their life um and i was like and i think at the same time we went eric trexler Mm -hmm. and yeah, we, we realized that if there was going to be a throuple that could work, um, without, of, of course, consulting the other person at all, we decided no. that they were going to be in a relationship <laughs> with us. Um, <laughs> I think we both came to a consensus that if we were going to open this relationship up, uh, up, there would be one person, and that's Eric, that's Dr. Eric Trexler. Um, yeah, it's like it reminds me of what you just said, and it, it's pivotal. I, I like hearing about your personal uh, journey, Eric. It reminds me of the great uh, psychoanalyst, um, Tobias Fimke, the man inside me, right? Where inside of me is a, is a man <laughs> even bigger than me, um, where it just it just felt right. And that's why I am thrilled to announce with Eric that Iron Culture is changing, but what we regard obviously for the better in the sense that we are bringing, we have on the obelisk, Connor Heffernan, we have the mass crew, but now we're officially bringing on board Eric Trexler as a co-host who will now then have the ability to, you know, suggest idea, like all the things that we do. And I think it's, you know, so it's three atop the pyramid, three atop, three atop. Yeah, it's it's, I'm sticking with thruple. I love how you said thruple. The iron thruple. And what I've wanted for a long time, right, is that. Eric communicates on a very high level, but he makes it uh, easy for people, once again, to understand. But sometimes when things are being covered, some of my favorite podcasts that I listen to outside of fitness, it's a conversation. And so 
Can there be more thoughts or ideas on these topics or ways for it to feel more conversational in ways when people are discussing some of these high level ideas? And I think we want to do two things at once. We always want to make Iron Culture accessible, but I think you guys have a rare skill set. And why not flex on that in the sense that you can really go all the way in as your private conversations in terms of what you do uh, for mass in terms of really like, you know, Trexler's example right now with some of the research he's doing, which is crazy at, at Duke University. Like we're talking about some cutting cutting edge research and two people in my personal opinion, again, this is heavily biased, sure, that are at the best when it comes to science communication, exercise science communication. And so now it's all united under the same roof. I view it as a massive win. And let me just say that I am personally very grateful that Trexer decided to accept because we thought ourselves like, hey, like, let's make this thing better. We had the great conversation and we were lucky. We, we brought him in a room, a virtual room, and we said, you here in betwixt us. And he said, I'm so confused. And then we had to actually explain it, but I'm glad it went off without a hitch. No, I'm 100% on board. And uh, I think uh, the, the, the big challenge for us is that um, Trexler is a more mature adult than either one of us. And, um, you know, there, there are times that, that you've described me as the, as the adult in the room. But um, you're going to see that there are, there are levels to that. <laughs> and uh, like if you if anyone watched our, our mass office hours, if you want to know who picked out the music, who got that technology to work, who created the nice framing, um, who encouraged us to improve our audio, uh, all of these things that are objectively good and help content. Um, I'm on board with them, but I'm not necessarily the progenitor of them. And, uh, you know, I, I can get the basics done, but all the things, Omar, that you've seen that I've brought to Iron Culture were things that other people had done for me previously on things like the 3DMJ podcast or things I'd learned in, you know, being a part of mass or a part of the, uh, the muscle and strength pyramids. I, I'm, I'm, I'm an ideas man, okay? I'm a visionary. I don't mm -hmm. have the brain space, aka I am too dumb and not detail-oriented enough to do a lot of the things, but uh, I tell you what. Trex is uh, just as much, if not more, of a Renaissance man than either one of us, and he has amazing gaps in his basic like participation in society, which I love because I relate to. I have some of those as well. Like he has not watched probably any movie in the last thirty years. Love it. Uh, and you know he, if he was still eating chicken, he would probably microwave it. Um, but at the same time, he also can run basically most stats models. Uh, he knows how to interact with technology. He understands uh, complex, uh, you know, physiology topics. And he's also, you know, he's competed in bodybuilding and he has a, you know, perspective on mindfulness and he's incredibly humble. He's, he's a unique fellow. And uh, I think he's going to bring a dimension to iron culture that um, is really going to help us get off into mm -hmm. a higher level if you know yep. what i mean you know yep. take off take off is what take, i mean take off yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, correct, sometimes correct. we there's a word we're thinking of eric and we'll have to think of new movie references that he'll totally not get because it was stuck together which again if you haven't watched this class we should be getting royalties like i i hate to bring up once mm -hmm. again financial gain but we've at least at least increased the amount of people that have rented that movie by two or three and that's not percent that's just the raw absolute amount a hundred percent I would totally agree. So I expect Owen Wilson to personally pay me the the cost of three rentals from Blockbuster, which I'm pretty sure it's at least one store open somewhere in the world. Thank you. Yeah, and Eric, I, I'm honestly I'm gonna add an extra fee. An extra fee is the memory, which is honestly almost priceless. So our resources could become once again potentially infinite, uh, which is what we need because we're funding we're funding several different projects. What you said about Trexer, everything holds true. I am convinced, I don't want to start a rumor, and it's not one born out of jealousy or in defense of uh, Helms uh, here, where I'm like, let's open up. I'm like, no, 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 let's close it. But I'm actually low-key convinced because Trex has such a great skill set. But as you said, like some of the basic gaps out of the pop culture reference, it doesn't really matter, that he might be grown in a vat. 
And I don't say mm. that, yeah, I don't I don't want to make this accusation without him being here, but there is one of my favorite cyberpunk uh, series of all time graphic novel, Warren Ellis Transmetropolitan, where one of actually the vice presidential candidates in order to make the person squeaky clean, they grow this person in a vat so they have no you know bad history, anything that could come back to negatively affect the president. And that's Trexler for us in the sense that I'm convinced You know, if you take a look at this man, it is not only squeaky clean, he's just a good human being. Um, And those who programmed him, whoever the benevolent individuals may be, they didn't have enough RAM space. They're like, okay, stats, let's 10 out, let's max this out. Level uh, of knowledge, exercise, like everything you need to successfully run a podcast, be a competent human, all that, max, 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 max. Has he watched any film in the last 30? We're like, ah, we're out of space. So that's that's one of the tells probably, Eric, that he was grown into that. Yeah, he got to 1993, and then it was like uh, <laughs> space filled, and they were like, "Nah, it's fine." You yeah. know, what's what's the big deal? So, no. But anyway, all in all seriousness, uh, both Omar and I are ex- ecstatic that Trexler onto on board. We got the Iron Thruple. There's three atop the pyramid. I know this is going to be a shakeup, and if uh, if you're struggling with that. Um, just remember that uh, you don't get a voice because you're not atop the pyramid. <laughs> so you have to accept it. So problem solved. Um, yeah. So with that announcement out of the way, we, we got some other things to talk about. This is one yep. of those episodes where we're uh, bouncing around a little bit. No firm topic, but we haven't had a duo. We haven't yep. had that catch up time. And some things are happening in the world. USAPL Mega Nats just happened, Omar. And there were some dare I say historic performances yeah yeah so for one yes go ahead you go I just just want to say as a fan what is what's interesting that's why I think people got it twisted our perspective from iron culture I'm thrilled to see powerlifting and powerlifters excel at the highest level and records being shattered and I want more people to see it at the same time it's fine like that's why Eric when Perkins set that record I'm there on the live stream that I was actually participating in the chat, just like just messing around, whatever. But I said, chat, I said, we need to get this above 2000 concurrent viewers because for both of us, we're like witnessing history here and we're like more people should be here to see it. But let me just say that we were at Sheffield, uh, saw worlds, like some of the things that happen in worlds and now USAPL, like raw Nats. Is this one of the banner years you think, uh, Eric, in the last 10 maybe I, I don't like you give your own personal opinion you'd probably be more qualified than myself in the drug tested uh feel for some of the records being broken some of the notable things what do you think man i think it's just exciting is, is what i'm getting at i think 2023 is hands down the breakout year in terms of just the the impressiveness of the performances and it makes me realize that the the, the, the peak of what does I don't think people understand how much more participation there is in, in, in raw drug tested powerlifting now than there was a while ago. Yep. Um, there were approximately maybe three to four thousand members in the US EPL around the time I started lifting. Yep. Now there are thirty to forty thousand. And again, this is a federation that's half split, right? Like we have PA and USAPL. So and that's just one country. So I mean, I think it is a I'm confident in saying there's 10 times the number of people participating in powerlifting today than there was a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago, somewhere in that range. And I don't think we're fully seeing until now what that means as far as the number of people, just statistically, that you're going to get at the top of that bell curve. So there was some crazy shit that happened at USAPL Mega Nets. Obviously, the one that you just brought up is probably most impressive because it was a substantial increase over what was considered one of the maybe the best male performance prior to this which was the 838 and a half total that you know Taylor Atwood did yep. which at the time was the highest total on any formula which is still an incredible total and everyone else was fighting to maybe reach 800 uh, and he did that and gave you know Russ or he a scare cuz he was only a few kilos off beating his total in the 83s. Yeah. That did happen with that with with uh with with this total. So Perkins would have won the 82 and a half kilo class. He totaled 851. It it's it's bonkers, you know? Like 
I think he was just he was like seventy four point two or point three. So it's it wasn't technically in the same weight class, but I mean, like, come on, right? It's 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 it it might as well be, and um, it was it was pretty mind blowing because it's fifteen ish. Okay, it's thirteen kilos on a total that was forty kilos more than what was considered elite. Yes, like 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 top of the top. So and it was not that long ago. That was only a few years back that Taylor Atwood did that. So that was was one of the incredible performances. So on the women's side, can we talk about Alexis Jones for a second here? So Alexis Jones, she's a you know, she's a super on the women's side, and I think she's still a junior dude because she just did collegiate nationals back in April and rocked the world by totaling 701 raw and i think that's the first time raw direct drug tested female has totaled over 700 but she just totaled she she blew that up so she just totaled to make sure make sure i get this right i think it's 721 and i i want to make sure i'm given all the respect that she is due 721.5 i see i almost robbed insane. her of half a kilo that's why you insane. take notes more. that is insane and at the like a 22 year old totaling 721 and a half male or female in any weight class is objectively impressive. And you know, that's an incredibly strong person for that age. Like, like, dude, I remember when I was competing, like, you know, like in the local meet, the strong super heavies, they'd be totaling in the low 700s, you know, like, and they're, you know, they're trying to build there and uh, it's just nuts. And so, so when you were talking about 2023, yep, it was just March that we saw Evie Corrigan shock the world, you know, total 460 as as a as a 52 dropping down a weight class freaking everybody out like whoa didn't see that coming and jesus olivares totaling more than anybody ever as a drug tested you know uh super heavyweight and then it worlds to see you know ev come back and do it going eight for nine purposefully saving the deadlift for the next sheffield right um a for eight seeing eight career Stay again. It went eight for eight. Like didn't even take eight, the last. Yeah, she went eight for eight. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Crazy, right? And uh, Carola Gara, um, you know, like taking Leah Bavois, uh, you know, uh, like her record, mm -hmm. and then us talking about it, saying, "Oh man, is it going to be uh, Leah or is it going to be uh, somebody else who gets best lifter?" And then out of nowhere, it's Natalie Richards with this. So. On the women's side, it's even more pronounced that we are absolutely nowhere near the top of the peak. If you go to and look at the IPF world records right now, I think all of the women's records were set in the last two years. All of them. If you look at the men's side, there are still some hangers on from like 2016. So I think we're, we're in the peak with the men right now because there's just been higher participation on the men's side, but that is absolutely changing. It's moving closer and closer and closer to a more even split in terms of the proportion of lifters uh, in powerlifting who are women. And that coming with the increase in total participation, not just women's participation, and we're starting to see that, oh shit, you know, what we thought was possible generally, and even more so on the women's side, I think we were underselling it. And I think we're gonna see a lot of gaps getting closed there's going to be a lot of confused men with their masculinity wrapped up into their strength, struggling with these concepts. Um, it'll be a good, it's a good struggle. To struggle is to grow. Um, but yo, 721 and a half, bro. And I mean, again, this is, again, coming off of Worlds, which was just in June. Yep. Where we saw, you know, the, the queen fall in the super heavyweights, super heavyweights, and we saw all these new titans emerge, right? So the top three incredible performances. I do think the women's 84 plus was was the most impressive uh, battle to watch. Uh, and just to see how that went, it, it was nuts, you know? So like Alexis's performance coming off that, it like, when is it going to stop leveling up? It, it's, it's pretty crazy to me. So um, I, yeah, that and, that and that's not all of them. So like Rondell Hunt, who is purposely weighing in under 120. He's in the 125 class because with a division split between USAPL and PA, they have different weight classes. But because he knows that the 120s, like there's things to go for there, he totaled, and again, I want to make sure I get this right. Yep. So 
Ten forty five at one nineteen. Insane. That is that's bonkers. That's a good total for a super, right? And he's doing it as a light one twenty five. And like Dennis Cornelius, um, again at the time when Dennis was at his peak, it was a similar level of untouchableness that Taylor was. Maybe not quite as high. So to see that just kind of getting like blown out of the water. I think Dennis is is a high 900s total, which again is incredible. But to be a mid 1000s total, that's a super heavyweight total, man. So so Rondell Hunt absolutely killing it, and then also Ashton Rushka, who we've had on the mm. podcast, amazing. The the classic battles he he had with um with Bryce oh, Lewis in yep. back to back years, um is still elevating. You know he was he, he was he's, he's, he's a young man now. He's a young man then. And he's got more left in the tank, but he also he competed in the 110s. But he was under 105, which I think is really, really good to kind of stir the like the the overall pot of like, oh my god! And he totaled, I want to say 960 again. Let me make make sure I get this right. Yeah, he's, I think 968. Like, what is that? You know that, that it's nuts. So uh, he might have been slightly over uh, 105. I might have that information wrong, but he's not far off at all. So the, the kind of stuff that we're that we're seeing right now in powerlifting, it just makes you go, wow, like these are it we're not at the top. And I think that's really interesting. You know, we, we've talked about whether or not we're at the top of the popularity. And I think it's interesting, right? Like right now among influencers and YouTube, there's not as much promotion outside of the hardcore powerlifting uh, channels of information. Like we're seeing a shift more towards hypertrophy and bodybuilding again, which I think is cool. Um, you brought up like, you know, Max and, and Jesse and some of these other really big name people, you know, competing in bodybuilding. And I think we're probably going to see kind of a resurgence of like the the Ogus era exactly. or any we've seen a few different eras. Yep. Right. It, like I, I've been around long enough in the game where I know that this this will change again. But it's funny, like we're seeing the popularity increase because we had that strength era. But there are a number of people who have kind of they're they're no longer pushing as hard as they were like, like, you know, I think. Johnny Candido, great example. Alan Thrall, great example. Um, you know, there was there was many folks like that in the space, which resulted in this delayed growth in powerlifting. And now we're seeing all those people who got into it at the top of their game with this tenfold higher participation. But now it's ironically, as they are just crushing the barriers that we thought were possible. Now the industry, as it as it always does, it goes in cycles. Is starting to focus more on the physique. So I'm I'm hopeful that maybe natural bodybuilding will will have yeah. a resurgence and we'll start to see that. Like because I don't necessarily think the competitiveness in natural bodybuilding is lower than it was, but I think it's it's been snail pacing up. Like absolutely, like if you go to Worlds in 2013, 2014, even though that was kind of at a the last peak, it's not as competitive as it was today. But it's not far off. But if you looked at Worlds. IPF Worlds, 2013 gets wrecked by 2023 Worlds, right? So I, I would like to see something like that. So anyway, just um, those are the, some of the performances that really stood out to me. Huge shout out to Alexis Jones, uh, Austin Perkins, Ashton Rauschka, um, and and Rondell Hunt because the, the it's just uh, it's it's they're just unbelievable numbers. And the uh, the lifting at USAPL uh, Nats Mega Nats was great. And also big shout out to the homie Bryce Lewis. He's the guy who was running the whole Super live smart. stream. And Real how level. much better was it than last year? Remember, there was it was actually a meme. It was a joke. Like, you know, you were seeing things pop up. It was covering the screen. And people were like, yo, USAPL really needs to up their game. But this was a great production. So this is a, a, a big win. Not only was IPF Worlds a huge step up in production, but so was USAPL uh, Mega Nats. So it's really good to see that as a whole, powerlifting is really elevating right now. Even if that's not where necessarily the interest is on YouTube or Instagram, Eric, a few things. As a fan of the sport, so I got into uh, powerlifting or getting stronger, and actually like kind of the, more focusing on the big three. I'd say around 2010 into 2011, which was before. So that would be on YouTube up in, in powerlifting space. That's very typical. There's nothing special about that. But that's before the boom. And so I'm seeing along with like Johnny, that's why I shout out actually to Nick Manders, uh, someone that uh, could be a Canadian lifter that was competing uh, in the same weight class, basically. Mm -hmm. um, 
was super competitive, but everyone's in the chat and like he, it, it was very nice. It, it, it almost feels always like a, like a high school reunion when you go to worlds or something like that, because you'll see either the coaches, the 100%. interaction and you, you see that line of succession, which is amazing. He's like, he's, he said, like, he was just joking. He's like, when you deadlifted 545 in the green Ranger, that's what I want to do. But now he's at the top of the field and I want that next generation, um, to be having the influence, but as a spectator, it's amazing to see such a high level and uh, also give credit to Bryce Lewis were super smooth, the live stream. So now it's finally catching up to the way that it should be. But two things I want to say, Eric, weird. This is like the positive episode. I don't know why I feel uncomfortable, but uh, uh, something, that, something that actually gives a pause for a confidence boost in terms of a global sport. We already spoke mm. about how powerlifting spread in English speaking uh, uh, countries predominantly like in the last like decade. And then over time, like if you take a look actually at IPF Junior Worlds, uh, the winners and the nations they're from, what's amazing to see, and I like even locally, so I'm giving obviously anecdotal things here, but there was a man from Lebanon, uh, as an example, that six months ago came to Fortis, but he's competing in Lebanon for the national team, just came here for a little bit, but he was all about, like, you see the international spread. So I do think, Eric, to your point, I think the total global participation of powerlifters continue to go up, and therefore we're going to see numbers go up. So just as a pure spectator, very exciting to see. I'm always just interested in viability long term because one yeah. of my back of the mind kind of concerns when I say viability is, and this is my personal opinion, the powerlifting in ways I think it's it's gotten more spectator friendly. But I think volatility and the unknown is something that excites people. And I think that's why in powerlifting, it was cool to see Ashton against Bob, against Keenan, uh, that showdown happened where it contextualizes mm -hmm. the weight. Because to your point, Eric, when you throw out those numbers, I'm following right along with you. When I was at Sheffield, it wasn't the problem of Sheffield, but just like the sport itself, maybe, where people couldn't then calculate based upon who's doing what, how close or how far. So you need to share a narrative. But here's my question I have actually for you when we talk about growth because man i'd love to see uh natural bodybuilding so now if it's if it's hypertrophies time okay winning the hypertrophies in the same way that what happened with powerlifting um here's my question for you genuine question because i think one of one of the hidden secrets um uh, why powerlifting uh exploded you mentioned johnny candido or alan just individuals that look when i say like fairly typical that's not an insult like, throw me in that loop where it's like they're not ginormous but they're lifting weight that people previously didn't think was possible for in quotations natural lifters so there's a relatability aspect all these records there's a lower barrier to entry right where like you could like myself we joked about that like 2013 like my numbers as lifting it actually was nationally competitive to the point where like theoretically if i competed like maybe and i did well could have went to worlds so people wanted to do it quickly they want to see how they stack up but I guess my my guess is no, but I want to hear from the natural bodybuilder. One of the potential barriers, one bodybuilding, true bodybuilding, getting so it's one thing to bulk and film for TikTok and have the optimal angles and like I gained in quotations 20 pounds of muscle, but like bro, between as we know, Eric, 13 to 18 percent body fat, nebulous guys are notoriously horrible at measuring their own body fat, but also being true with themselves. That if people had to lean down, so let's say if we open it up, Eric, if someone caught the bug, here's my question for you. And this is like the million dollar question, my friend. Johnny was able to go to Worlds and place fourth. Do you think any of the, pop, not them specifically, but I'm just saying the influencer class of lifters, do you think that natural bodybuilding is still so competitive where there's unknowns, where these people haven't gone through multiple preps to learn their body, to get in shape, and like we still have those freaks doing so well in natural bodybuilding? Do you think it's possible for any of these influencers to place in the top rarefied category? Because if that's to happen, I would put forth, if that is a possibility, that would build excitement because it's like, oh, that's our person, right? Like I know, like when Johnny, and I'm speaking again as a viewer of YouTube, when he competed at Worlds, it was like, oh, that's like in quotations, one of us competing. And it was seen as a big, I'm telling you that was a big event, mm -hmm. but I am not I am not sure because I think they're two completely different sports. You've done the damn thing. You've coached hundreds of athletes. I think there's a huge difference between getting big biceps for Instagram and filming, we joke, like I, I like the basement joke, and then doing the sport of bodybuilding and doing it well. So 
my question for you, Eric, do you think it's a possibility as we shift over and some of these people, shout out to Max Taylor and those others that competed that have uh, more notable channels like uh, Alex, uh, Alpha Destiny, not them, I'm not, like you're not critiquing physique, sure. uh, physique, but just the general, what it takes to be at a high level. Do you see that as a possibility? Yeah, I think um, to, to answer the bigger question without directly answering you, and I will directly answer you as well. Yeah. I don't think um, the strength boom... So let's put it this way. Powerlifting was one of the main beneficiaries of the strength boom because it gives a competitive outlet raw powerlifting that is very accessible. You get a singlet, you get some shoes, you get a belt, you spend 40 bucks and you're competing and you get refs in front of you and you don't have to have the shoulder flexibility or or the the athletic skill that you need to do Olympic weightlifting. That's both disrespect to all the power lifters and respect to the Olympic weightlifters and disrespect <laughs> to myself because I tried and I failed. Me too. Um, right. So it's, it's um, Olympic weightlifting, even though it's part of the Olympics, even though you've got these incredible athletes, all that, it's so visually appealing. Um, there's only so far a strength boom could carry it. Yep. Um, the strength boom absolutely made strongman into a, into a spectator sport. Like everyone in the game watches the Arnold and, and the like world's strongest man because it's awesome to see because it's so visually engaging. And you see these mountains of people just doing incredible things in strong woman and strong man. Uh, and pulling a truck or pushing a log over your head, it like you can't even sometimes tell whether someone's lifting 270 or 320, right? So, anyway, my point is, is that um, you have to look at from a sport perspective. How much can it be a beneficiary of something? And in my mind, it's no surprise that the participation in something like powerlifting grew a lot from the strength boom. I don't think that's going to happen with natural bodybuilding, competitive natural bodybuilding, nor do I think it really should Mm. because it is demanding. And like, like 100%, there's a lot of people who got into powerlifting and got really obsessed with it and had some athletic identity issues and who am I without powerlifting? But that happens with all sports in a very similar way. Yep. And there was absolutely some people who got hurt, but let's be honest, like the injury rates in powerlifting are like a third of what they are in basketball. So let's, let's not like, yeah, you can compare it to bodybuilding. That's way more dangerous. It's like, well, yeah, like, but we're comparing like driving in the Midwest versus, you know, walking in a city versus skydiving. Right. So like they're, they're not the same. So uh, we're comparing two relatively safe activities. So I don't really, there's no issue with a strength boom, increasing participation in powerlifting, I would say it's probably way more good than bad. Yep. If everyone who saw the influencers doing awesome hypertrophy training and changing their physiques decide to compete in bodybuilding, I would be like, Ooh, you know, like, <laughs> like when it happens, I, I, I would like it because it would mean that they're probably choosing to go the drug-free route rather than the enhanced route. And I don't want to discourage people from competing in enhanced bodybuilding. It's just that you don't want to get into that not knowing what you're doing. And we've talked about that before. And it's just it's, a, it's just another level of risk. And it's another level of not being able to walk back some of the consequences. While natural bodybuilding, absolutely, you can develop a relationship with, your, with food or your body that can take years to repair if you don't come into it with a healthier mindset and you don't have the right, the right why. But then if you just throw anabolics on top of that, there's a level of risk and danger that, I mean... You can have, uh, you know, the misinformation or the wrong information of the wrong coach and the wrong combination of extreme personality and the popularity and the drive, and you can end up killing yourself on on game day yep. because you did some crazy shit with diuretics, right? So um, I am not – first, I don't think bodybuilding – generally or natural bodybuilding com- like competitive enhanced or drug-free bodybuilding is going to grow to the same extent that powerlifting grew from the current hypertrophy boom that's going on compared to the current strength boom and two i don't think it should i think it hopefully will give some shine and respect to bodybuilding and i think bodybuilding always has the potential to be a good spectator sport at least the highlights because yep. it is some pretty incredible physiques and it and there's always people who go to see all these sick physiques. I think natural bodybuilding has far more uh, participant fans than enhanced bodybuilding will because it is a little more of a freak show. So it's a little different. I don't think that's necessarily a problem. So I think natural bodybuilding's growth is somewhat capped. That is my answer. I think it'll grow a little bit, but it won't be like powerlifting. To answer your question more directly, most of the people with awesome physiques who are truly drug-free 
um, would do well in bodybuilding, but they would not do do nearly as well as their followers would think. Um, even if we say their physiques, let's say they're, they're not using filters, structure, or filming themselves well, which they absolutely are. Let's just say they weren't. Um, if those physiques could get shredded and they learned how to pose and they presented themselves well, then maybe they would do really well. But that's actually, there's a, there's a ton of skill that goes into that. Um, and I think there's probably some proportionate relationship to how good a physique looks on social media versus how it would compare on stage. And it is always not as good as people think. So um, Matt Ogus, I coached him. He's a competitor's competitor. He's not an influencer. He was a competitor who was also an influencer. I don't want to pigeonhole him by any means. Ton of respect for the guy. Um, and he, com- he, he may still compete in the future, but he competed and did not actually turn pro. He got to multiple overalls and he is what I would describe as a top tier amateur who just if he'd competed a few more times would have been a pro. And I think he could have been a competitive pro. But people were very surprised, his followers, that anybody could beat him. They thought it was a shoe and there's, nobody can touch him. And there was this incredulousness when he didn't necessarily win or he placed second. And there was always this response of, oh, did he not peak well? And it's like, no, he did. He, he peaked really well. It's just you're no longer you're giving up control over how you look to the stage photographers and to some degree, a different version of reality. Mm-hmm. Right. So when you are controlling your own Instagram, you're controlling your own YouTube. And if you've ever hung around influencers, they take like 600 pictures and two of them go online. Mm-hmm. I'm not exaggerating. And there is editing going on. There is lighting, not in all cases, but many times. Um, and that has not changed. And in fact, it's gotten more savvy. Um, I know a lot of people think it, and a lot of these guys who are saying they're natural are also on gear. Sure. But let's just Let's just talk about the drug-free ones. I don't even think gear is the biggest thing. I really do think it's that people uh, position themselves so that they can always look favorable. And it creates yes. this yes. this idea of what someone looks like that is actually quite divorced from reality. And, you know, like, like the type of content that bodybuilders make, actual competitive bodybuilders, like some of our popular videos um, that we give to all our competitors is how to take good pictures. And it's not how to make yourself look better. Like Berto has one. It's like, okay, you want a really bright light straight on um, so that you don't have, you know, cuts that you don't like, like you want to have not a washed out look, but an accurate view. So like when I, when I do my prep updates, I have a couple times talked about this and I've juxtaposed me posing in the in gym lighting or the, like the lighting that we had while we were in Texas, you know, which is just really, really, really favorable versus me at 10 a.m. on my Sunday check into Birdo with the natural sunlight coming through where it's giving a much more objective look. And it's like in that lighting, if I look good, I'm ready. But it's not favorable lighting. You know, it's, it's honest lighting. And that's the exact opposite of what someone who's an influencer trying to do. They want to look good to influence you, while a bodybuilder wants to have an objective view of where they're at so they can gauge progress. So, and not that, you know, not every influencer doesn't do that sometimes, but it's not what they're sharing most of the time. And in fact, it's this like, it's probably more common among some of the women influencers, like, I'm going to take the the no makeup, not not flexed picture Extreme. just to show you that I'm okay with my body and this, and then, and it's a shock to people because it's the, so contrary to what most people do. So I think to answer your question, a lot of the, the the bar is absolutely lower to have a good physique online because you get to control the environment. If you have an average physique, you can look, like if you are a six out of 10, you can appear eight out of 10. And if you have an eight out of 10, people think you should be a world champion and they, they encourage you to compete. And if you have something higher than that, then they just assume you're on drugs. Eric. Uh, man, so many things to talk about. Uh, I love it. And I think <clears throat> part of it, the question in in and of the question was a suggestion. And what it was is that I always kind of want to know what is the reality that we are all experiencing simultaneously together, not the one that you carefully construct for yourself. And what would be analogous for me in parallel thing would be if there's people, again, it doesn't matter, pick platform, so IG, YouTube, TikTok, but they are power lifters who never competed, but they also control their own environment. And that's why I purposely 
there are some people that have not competed or let's say they have competed, their numbers are a certain amount, but I know they use uh, Eric, like these are very minor things, but like a, uh, like a fisheye lens. So if their butt lift, uh, leaves uh, the bench, no one can see. Uh, if they, as an example, I know of an influencer who's actually very big, uh, but again, you tell me something in private, I'm not going to expose you that they wore a hoodie when they did a bench press and they put elbow wraps around their elbows so they could bench more. I know someone that benched with the deadlift bar and timed the whip for eight weeks and actually got another 15 pounds out, which sounds crazy. Like how much is that? Was it 15? How much was belief? But it's still like you're gamifying the system. And I think I always like to know, once again, what is the reality of things? And that's why as someone who's not competed, but highly respects competition, I like this. And that's why, why do you think, like, I trained at Fortis where people are surprised, shout out um, to Ellis McLean when he came there. The plates were actually heavy there because when I trained in a place or we went to game day barbell, it's like that is a place that has all calibrated plates where what I'm going to portray to my audience will be the most accurate portrayal of what is actually going on. Not saying I could do that at a meet, but like, here are the mm-hmm. numbers, here are the things. And I think within, not bodybuilding, but those that endeavor for aesthetics, let's use that big uh, uh, term here, there is not that same, like, uh, uh, how do you say, rule set here so we could standardize what we are viewing. And so people will extra gamify things. And I think to me, Eric, that's what's disappointing. So there's two there's two things I want to say, and that's why obviously I feel very confident we'll talk maybe just in another episode, like my own I want to talk about uh, yours, man. But there's two things. I feel very confident now that the fire has been lit and I'm training again for real, for real this time, that the change will happen over a year. When I go back to Grant Tinsley's lab, I want to go why back to Grant, state of the art facility here where Grant can actually quantify what is being changed. And my challenge I'm going to throw out there, Eric, in one of the videos is any natural like YouTube channel or whoever, I will pay for your flight so you can go there also, measure yourself. You don't have to come with me, but like you'll measure it. You'll get a number. You'll figure out exactly what your true body comp is because some people that are claiming 14%. They don't want that smoke, yeah. Omar. But, uh, but the, then, and, then they have and, yeah, to actually right. like step outside of their carefully constructed reality. Then no one's going to mm. take you up on that. Tough. But, and that's why, Eric, so there's there's two things that simultaneously occur. And that's why, like, this is in defense of the surf clam by the surf clam. But I purposely, like, why do you think you looked incredible in 2019? And I do the joke pose where, like, like guts out this and that, like, I'm relaxed. Um, but I'll show many different forms of, let's say, the physique. So carefully crafted, ideal lighting. I got your help for that photo shoot. It's the one that got, like, the 20,000 likes. I did, like, you know, I leaned down and looked good, whatever. And then I'll also show me, like, just relax, so stomach out no real posing. Then I'll also show like the I'm soft look, but because no other kind of male influencer does that, there's so, there's a high level of insecurity of which I don't think people are aware. When people will use photos of myself online or how I film even these days, it's not to show myself in the best light. They're like, oh, look at Omar's physique. It's like, so that's one thing. But then Eric, on the other hand, why is it when I meet up with other influencers, look at 2013, look at the collabs I did, look at later where there's some, I'll just say bodybuilders that are known for having particular physique or people that train, let's say for aesthetics, and you put me next to them and routinely people are shocked what I look like next to someone that once again has gamified the system. And one of them certainly was a watershed moment, honestly, for my channel. I didn't intend this, bro, was with Elliot when I went there. He's like a, he was like a 5'8 guy. He's 230. Uh, his people viewed him as like, you know, like this elf on the other is huge. And I went there and like, you know, I, I'd been training Eric and like, you know, you could look at the videos of us next to each other. But I think that's most important. And I think that's the only part that just irks me a little bit that we continue to see and why I want to continue to platform. Like I love the journey that you're on, like what a, the 3DMJ does is I want to be able to just insert a little bit more of that reality into the conversation because then it's almost like a runaway uh, like effect where everyone's playing the same, you know, artificial construct together. Yeah, like people are competing in the influencer space with how good they can make themselves appear, right? Yes. And um, competition, where you're actually deciding to get in the arena, you are giving up control and you're saying, I'm going to put myself out there. It's scary. Um, I'm going to adhere to the same rules of reality you know like like don't get me wrong like on stage i have tanner on we're peaking there is good lighting if if the promoters are doing it right everything is designed to make you look good but it's the same for everybody there are like if if dream tans banned nobody gets to use it you get marked down points if you do if everyone's supposed to use the same show tanner use the same show tanner same lights there or the same lights 
Like you're all on the same stage at the same time. So you are exposing yourself. You're, you're, you're deciding, all right, I'm going to face reality and see what I can do. And if I can get in a time and a place I don't choose on a schedule, and I'm going to compare myself against others. So it's, it's true competition. And it is, um, you're, you're, you're probably going to lose. You know, like if, if you see it as coming out on top is the only option. So, of course, it's it's um, I understand why people hide behind a, a lens. And I'm not even saying it like arrogantly, like, oh, if you really were a fucking man with a physique, you'd get on stage. Like, no, please don't. Like, this yeah. is not for everybody. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with with playing the smoke and mirrors game. That is literally the roots of bodybuilding and strongman. It was in vaudeville shows designed to make physiques look amazing and strength look amazing. And I think. That's a beautiful part of it, but it's something that we need to be aware of. You're going to a show. You go to see someone uh, do magic, you know it's magic. But I think the difference is, is that some of the influencers out there, it's a magic show, but they're saying this is real and buy my shit, you know, or, or buy into my cult of personality. Or, and I guess what? I can have you get the same results in, in the real world, not on my carefully cultivated channel. Um, so... That's a problem, right? And again, it just gets swept up and it's too superficial sometimes. Like, oh, like it's the natty or not thing. Like that's the issue. It's like, no, that's that's not the issue. That's part of an overall issue of, again, these curated realities which are disconnected from our own, which are used as sales devices that hook, line, and sinker people. So I, I 100% agree it's a great thing to interject some reality. And I think one way to do that on a personal level is to submit yourself to the arena and compete. But again, I only recommend that to a very, very small minority of people because it is a, it doesn't make sense as far as the risk reward and benefits and unless it really does make sense internally. So I, um, yeah, I don't know that this boom should or will produce a boom in natural bodybuilding. I think it will result in increased competition but I think it'll be a small minority of people who stick around with it uh, and and find an attachment to the sport. And um, I think bodybuilding is always going to be a little niche in that way because like it has all the pieces that that could make it as booming and as popular as powerlifting. But you can tell they just don't get the same traction because it's largely an insular community. Like for example, big shout out to Natty News Daily. They're kind of doing what like Ryan Lapidat is doing with King of the Lifts. You know, they're commenting on the Mr. America. Mm. Mr. America right now is a uh, a natural bodybuilding show. It's like you got the old name. So it's got the title, right? Marketable. Boom. And it is open to all people uh, in the natural bodybuilding organizations who are pro. If you're a pro, it doesn't matter if it's INBA, OCB, WNBF, uh, DFAC, whatever, you can compete. So like the best of the best compete cross federation uh, it's live streamed. You've got the Nattier, you got the the Natty News Daily guys commentating, who basically do like this regular updates on the natural bodybuilding scene, much in the same way that you know Ryan has platformed a lot of the um, you know the drug tested powerlifters. But you can just see that the level of uh, engagement and popularity they have is it's it's exponentially lower, and it's not a reflection of a lack of quality. It's a reflection of there's only so many people who can directly participate in bodybuilding or should. And if we're thinking about it from a purely spectator sport, if you're not going to participate and you can't relate to it, there's more likelihood that you're just going to want to see a bigger version of it. Not always. So I do think a lot of people just don't like the aesthetics of enhanced bodybuilding. And that's obviously true based on, on the fact that Chris Bumstead's more popular than like the Open Olympia. But I think natural bodybuilding is not quite producing the superhero level physiques on a regular basis. And then there's also this constant frustration of any time you do start to see the superhero level physiques, there's a very loud, although I do think is a minority group of people who just claim cheating and nefariousness in it, and it takes some of the air out of it. So there's, I think, some some very challenged, very challenging, uh, not insurmountable, but very challenging barriers towards natural bodybuilding itself, competitive natural bodybuilding, growing a ton in response to this current interest that we have in physique development. But I, I will say that I think if there is a core nugget that we can keep, I think we're very instrumental to it. And I hate to pat, pat ourselves on the back, but having 
some true meaning and figuring out why it's worth doing this and focusing on physique development as a vehicle for personal growth, um, just like you can do with strength, I think is, is what's been missed every time this comes around, you know, because the most marketable aspect of physique changes are external rewards, but they're absolutely not what keep people in it. They're absolutely not what uh, really hooks somebody. They're not the thing. Like it might get, you, you might get in the door because you want to look better for the opposite sex or the same sex or, or whatever your your jam is. But what keeps you in the gym and what keeps you focused on this, you know, whether it's a connection to the artistry of bodybuilding, whether it's competing, or whether it is seeing if you can maximize your potential, just like whether you want to become the best sushi chef or the best musician or whatever. Once you realize that that's it, and then it is like that dogged pursuit of something of self betterment, and you know it's 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 not easy work, but it's honest work kind of mentality. I think that that's what keeps people around, and you know when they don't have that view, it, it almost always goes badly or just stops. You know, like oh, I I'm I gotta progress no matter what, and then they go enhanced and they don't really feel good about it, and they don't want to tell people, and then that runs out. Or it runs into a barrier of I don't have the money or I can't stomach the health consequences of just constantly improving. And it's like, well, why are you even trying to improve? Like, what what is the core of this? Like, it's not just being bigger and better all the time. Like, that can work in the construct of competition. But that's that even that ends. So all things end, right? As a... Uh, as 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 a, as a great philosopher Gary Vee said, you're gonna die, right? <laughs> so so what what why are we doing this? So anyway, just just to kind of square that circle, I think with more interest in this, there'll be a lot more people at a superficial level getting involved and probably having a bad experience. But it's also more opportunities for them to stumble onto content about what this really can mean and what it can be as far as a beneficial force in your life, and you know sharpening the sword of who you are as a human. Eric, we're going to have to, uh, we're going to wrap up this episode. I want to come back to another episode then, because I know when my man is competing, I love to see it. I notice also with Birdo and I actually Ryan Dort, there is, there is something about this journey where you're an introspective individual. You're very good at giving yourself like a self audit and you, you have these gems that then you bring that comes from a place and experience that is rarefied. So I enjoy hearing about it. That's like Birdo, same idea. I remember like there's a Ryan Doris post, like this is years ago now, but there's something that unless you pursue it, and I think I actually was having a good conversation, I'll say just very quickly, the uh, YouTube channel, a uh, shout out to uh, GVS, we're, we're just joking around because I said, hey man, like you're making great progress. I said, don't you think it's interesting that basically like people online, you are very big, you are very muscular, uh, but there are basically these natural bodybuilders that are to a level of muscularity and leanness, like the whole package of being able to compete, that I think if these people that are now latching on to, let's call it aesthetics-focused uh, training, were to be aware of, they would be amazed. And we're just discussing it. And I said, I actually think, Eric, it's antithetical to one of the purest pursuits of natural bodybuilding, which is honestly almost like a question of integrity, and it's an inward pursuit. There's a reason why I would put forth that natural bodybuilders choose ultimately not to really participate in social media, even though if they gamified their following, they could grow a massive following, and that is because they know the focus, the direction they want with their journey. The end goal for themselves, if they are competing, it's like all that matters, man, is underneath those lights, which guess what? Those lights are not optimized to make you look good on the gram. They're optimized to be able to evaluate yourself against other competitors for competition, this is the journey they're on. It's an in, intrinsically they derive a lot of satisfaction. So it's not about like, oh my god, like three weeks out, look at this uh, uh, crazy journey. And so I, it's almost unsurprising to me that like a lot of lifelong natural bodybuilders choose to not participate in social media, where it's their physique, Eric, that everyone wants. Isn't that an interesting yeah. paradox? And it's almost like you have to find wow. the monk in the wilderness, right? Like kind of what you're talking about here, where like there's people that know and have done the damn thing, but they're not the loudest voices. I, I I think to me, that's something that's truly incredible. Yeah. Like if, if, if anyone wants to see the biggest and arguably one of the best natural bodybuilding shows in the world, uh, 18th and 19th of November world championships, the amateurs and the pros two day competition that's uh, going down in the Seattle greater area. Um, there's going to be probably, five, 600 competitors in total, if I had to guess. 
anytime like and you look at them on stage like if you look at like the pro the pro lineup you'll be like oh my god every single one of these people if they knew how to monetize instagram could be (laughs) huge influencers if they had the personality for it and i would say maybe one person on stage in each one of those lineups is actually leveraging it in in even a decent way you know and um it's mind-boggling there are hundreds if not thousands of people with physiques better than the average influencer who is actually on a little bit of gear who are lifetime naturals who just don't do anything with that except for their pursuit because it is a very a very different game for them they're not doing it for the same reasons so i'm someone who does it for those same reasons and then tries to just communicate it mm-hmm. which is yeah. you know and it's like what you know but anyway yeah i'm only a week out Let's from my on. first show of the season my competitive artistic dance with uh with 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 this this shared cured non-curated reality um so yeah i'm I'm doing the damn thing i'm jumping in the arena and then for the next seven weeks after that i'll be doing it all the way up to worlds and i'll be on that stage at worlds come hell or high water unless things go really poorly and i don't even qualify (laughs) but um no 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 you're looking fantastic man like that's why i'm excited for you on a personal level as a friend um I just love what you bring to the table um, every single time because I feel as you really dive deeply into doing what you love and going through the process, you like people that are once again introspective. So I'd say like the 3DMJ team and other like lifelong bodybuilders, they walk away with new insights about themselves and about everything. Like I like it. Absolutely. Um, there's such an opportunity from the um, the crucible of prep to grow as a person. And I do also like to really... Like I, for me, it is both art and sport, yeah. which is, which is, there's very few things that are, you know, um, which is probably why I was into hip hop back in the day. Cause there's always that competitive aspect of all four elements of, of hip hop, you know, break dancing, rapping, you know, like it's, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's similar to that. You get to express yourself and then compete in expressing yourself. And it's this very solitary pursuit. And then you get to like show it to the world. What have I been like? It's you know I, I get it. These guys on Instagram doing all this stuff in the dungeon, and then they they show it to the world every week in a curated kind of environment. There's nothing wrong with that, but then to do it in a competitive environment, it's just a very very unique weird thing that I love. Eric, I just wonder for those basement dwellers, if more parents love their children, if more dads just said, "I'm proud of you and I love you." For those like for the bed where it's like take a look at this i'm like all right guys. like there's there's a few i could think of like at tiktok in particular um man i gotta i i don't i'm not even gonna go on this tangent but we gotta get connor back on where we talk about like yes. muscular christianity like in particular like, just like some of the things that we're seeing that it's like it's not i wish it was a meme but it's not of a guy doing bicep curls and uh, anyway like there's i i love what you uh do um, we will have a, another episode just more about that. Like, like you're going to do the season. We're going to see like what we could obviously record. It's going to be busy for you. Um, but iron culture, I mean, there's always new things developing and I am thrilled alongside you, man, to bring the Dr. Eric Trexler, um, how to go completely different for the third person mm-hmm. that we brought on. Um, it's like, we think there's Eric high- might be missing from the next episode, but Eric won't be. Exactly. And I thought to myself, I said, hey, what could make this podcast better? And I thought to myself, more Eric. So that's what we did. Um, you know, it's the whole question like uh, turning up to 11. It's like, why not just make 10, 11? And then he's like, but this one's better. That's that's why like anyone says like, but why get two Eric's? I'm like, but this one's better. I'm just pointing to the podcast. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Well, thank you everyone for listening to another episode of Iron Culture. If you liked it, we have almost, I, th- I think it's some of the crazy, like written reviews, maybe 500 uh, over the last several years. Uh, we'll do our best to uh, read them. We appreciate everyone taking the time to write those lengthy reviews full of like, you know, deep lore references, which I like it. It's like hidden lore that only people, I was like, oh, I, that was from like episode 73, I remember. Um, people will typically give five stars. We leave it once again to your own discretion. We're back every single insert date here from now until the end of time. We'll catch you in that next episode.